Hello, listeners. Thanks for tuning into The Spark, medical education for curious minds, where we present the people and stories behind medical advances at UCSF, including those led by medical students, physicians, and faculty in the School of Medicine. Through The Spark, we share the innovations at UCSF that are helping bring more equitable and better care to our communities. I'm Karen Fleming, Communications Manager for the Office of Medical Education. And I'm Greg Gadwood, Instructional Designer for the Technology Enhanced Education Team. In this episode, we showcase the latest research and patient care initiatives at UCSF and its School of Medicine focused on treating people with chronic pain, including student work in this area. We'll hear from Dr. Mark Schumacher, Professor in Chief of the Division of Pain Medicine in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Care, as well as third year medical student Emma Levine. So Dr. Schumacher, what sparked your interest in the research and treatment of chronic pain? Well, you know, interestingly enough, some of the most poignant memories was back when I was a medical student and ended up having an operation myself and had a a hernia repair, an inguinal hernia repair. And I had incredible pain postoperatively, which was poorly controlled and Frankly, when I was given the medications that I received for the pain, it, it helped a little bit, but it just constipated me. And I, I was just struck that this seemed to be so uh, uh, backwards. Uh, given all the high tech and all the advanced knowledge of other areas of medicine, this seemed to be kind of way out of, out of line. And while helping plan course electives on chronic pain for the Bridges curriculum, what were some of the key themes or issues that were incorporated? The treatment and management of pain is such a broad topic. Uh, one of the big parts that we talked about was uh, pain assessment um, and going well beyond just giving uh, pain a number, uh, which everyone has been exposed to, that zero is no pain, tens the worst pain. We've, we've all encountered patients with um, you know, 15 out of 10 pain, and, and that's their first response to their as- assessment. And, and so it makes it very difficult for physicians sometimes to understand where, where to take that. And what we really tried to stress and, and angle our, our response to teaching was, what's the context of a patient's report of pain, for example? Uh, so how is it interfering with their function, with their life? And our goals then may not be to uh, somehow get pain to a zero number, but rather uh, satisfy their goals, their functional recovery, and and what's important to them. So we wanted to stress that. We wanted to stress some of the basic neurobiology of pain pathways so they can make more intelligent or informed decisions, and also realize that a a single answer, a single uh, plan, often will fail and that one needs to look at an integrative approach to uh, not only the assessment but also the the planning to management so it may mean to to expose students to not only the pharmacology of analgesics which I think most people kind of reflexly turn to but also think in terms of the context the emotional response a patient may have how that feeds in how other uh, rehab and and functional uh, aspects of of, uh, recovery will will also be critical. What have you observed or helped lead develop yourself um, as leading advances at UCSF in treating patients and managing their care? Well, I oversee a division of pain medicine, so I see all the different venues that we provide. Personally, uh, uh, and getting back to why we're speaking, is the underlying issues that even though we have advanced certain understanding of molecular biology of sort of receptors and ion channels that can detect noxious stimuli, uh, all that information turns out to be not very helpful unless uh, there's a process of education and understanding integration into care uh, from the very beginning. Uh, One of the efforts has been over the years is to establish a center of excellence in pain education here at UCSF. Uh, through the National Institute of Health. And the the goal of that is to work on developing uh, teaching modules that are actually grounded in in actual um, but embellished uh, cases 
uh, that are you know realistic and also are some of the frontline challenges that students or physicians that are already trained face. It can be, for example, um, not just a, a, a patient that's never had an injury and never taken a pain medicine before, but rather the most challenging is someone that has a long history of some pain, may be taking opioids for a long term, may be tolerant of them or even have developed an opioid use disorder and then comes in for yet another complaint, maybe ongoing or new back pain. And uh, again, the idea is to develop a strategy in which one then disassembles that problem and approaches it in a multidisciplinary manner rather than just opioid monotherapy, for example. So working in that sense, working alongside other uh, folks in the development of curriculum through the Bridges program, for example. Can you describe a fairly recent moment in either caring for a patient or helping plan their care path or in teaching students that was especially inspiring or poignant for you? I do a lot of my clinical work is on the inpatient side and we'll see patients that are, are either have failed their outpatient a pain management program. They might have cancer or something that uh, has, has gotten loose and, and is break causing breakthrough pain and they come in for other medical reasons or they might have a big operation for example and I think one of the uh, big roles that physicians, all physicians play especially uh, those that are focused around pain management is giving patients hope that uh, there's a strategy and there is a plan that will bring them forward maybe not necessarily bringing their pain to zero but to uh, they'll be able to be functional. They'll actually be able to get out of bed, for example. They'll be able to maybe pick up their one of their kids. They'll actually be able to go home and manage by themselves eventually, and they won't have lost their independence. Now that we've heard from Dr. Schumacher about his research and new treatments being used at UCSF to care for people with chronic pain, let's hear from third-year medical student, Emma, about how elements of the Bridges curriculum are helping learners understand the mechanisms underlying pain and how to care for patients suffering from chronic pain due to injury or illness. Emma, what sparked your interest in the research and treatment of chronic pain? Growing up with scoliosis and migraine headaches, um, if it wasn't my head hurting, it was my back and vice versa. It was constantly finding a balance in life to avoid pain. And as I grew older, I found that pain is not just an internal experience. It is really shared with others in a number of ways um, that observers can see, evaluate, and interpret um, others' pain experiences led me to become interested in the mind-body connection uh, and pain. And as I read more about the genetics of pain, imaging in pain, of pain in the brain and the mind-body connection in pain, it really emphasized to me the variability and plasticity in the nervous system as it responds to painful events in a complex social and emotional environment. And it was my good fortune, really, to be able to spend my high school summers working in a lab at UCSF that aimed to better understand the pathophysiology of chronic pain and effective modalities to treat it. Um, and through this experience, I learned more about the diversity of chronic pain presentations, the complexity of the factors involved in chronic pain, and then the appalling mismatch between what people in pain need and what doctors know or can provide. While taking courses or electives on chronic pain in the Bridges curriculum, what were some of, the, some of the key themes or issues that you learned about? And feel free to describe any special training experiences that you had. Uh, what I came to appreciate in the UCSF Bridges curriculum's approach to chronic pain is that while we were learning about the basic physiology of chronic and acute pain from top-notch neuroscientists, we were also learning how uh, other factors like depression and substance abuse could be linked to pain. Um, and after the pain physiology lecture, we also addressed how a patient's pain and ways of coping affect her interactions with her medical team and family. So I feel like it was a really well-rounded approach to understanding pain and its interaction with the healthcare system. 
Additionally, through courses and electives on chronic pain, I learned that the National Institutes of Health spends only about 1% of its vast budget on pain research, despite the fact that chronic pain is now considered a disease in its own right and is actually a bigger problem than heart disease, cancer, and di diabetes combined. What do you see as being some of the toughest challenges in treating people with chronic pain? For me, I feel like medical school often rarely touches on chronic pain and its management. In about 80% of the world, pain biology and modern principles of pain relief um, and palliative care still aren't taught to medical students. This leaves a huge gap in terms of the wealth and depth of knowledge that we as physicians have in addressing our patients' concerns. It is absolutely essential that more time and resources are devoted to educating medical students and residents about how to diagnose and treat diverse pain syndromes. In light of the current opioid epidemic, the lack of understanding of how to adequately treat chronic pain without giving addictive medications is a challenge that we will continue to face as well, and it will require a lot of trial and error, which can be time consuming and emotionally draining for patients. And lastly, there are many non-pharmacological modalities that we can use in the treatment of chronic pain, a lot of it requiring time and money, limiting factors for many patients in this day and age. With regards to time, it's hard to ask patients to go see a physical therapist three times per week. That is on top of working, taking care of a family or oneself, and focusing on mental and physical health to balance the emotional stress of living with chronic pain. And with regards to finances, seeing therapists and acupuncturists and massage therapists and doctors can really add up. And if surgery comes into the equation, the cost and social impact are amplified exponentially, placing a huge financial burden on individuals as they seek multiple modalities to address this debilitating disease. Can you describe a fairly recent moment in either caring for a patient or helping plan their care path? or in your learning experiences in the Bridges curriculum that was especially poignant or inspiring for you? For me, one of the most poignant experiences has actually been watching my uh, mom, a gastroenterologist, suffer from severe sciatica. Um, during these past few months, she could barely talk through the pain, through the, though the mere words can't have captured her experience of pain anyway. Um, so new and shocking was all this that it often seemed like she felt utterly alone. I'm convinced that no one had ever felt the pain she was feeling. It took several doctors, multiple physical therapists, acupuncturists, and a multitude of massage therapists from Hawaii to London and San Diego to San Francisco, um, more dr drugs, including gabapentin, than she had ever imagined she'd need before she began to um, feel better. And it really took her own perseverance and research to get the help she needed. Um, some people never do, and this shouldn't be happening in a country as medically sophisticated as ours, and yet it still does. I think as a doctor, she was shocked when she accidentally became a pain patient at how little her colleagues, pain specialists, knew about pain. It was unnerving for me as her daughter and a medical student feeling hopeless as I watched her suffer in pain. Um, there's such an urgency about pain. You need to have the other person really know in order to help you, but there's a divide between the sufferer and the outside observer, and pain brings these boundaries between people into such acute focus. For me, the biggest lesson was to remember that we as physicians are humans too. We focus all of our energy on caring for our patients, but we too can suffer from chronic pain. I'm currently on my surgery rotation and standing in the OR for hours, sometimes hunched over to see the action or pulling the retractor in an ergonomically unnatural way, uh, I've begun to realize the toll our jobs can have on our bodies. And it reminds me to be kind towards my body and to listen when my friends, colleagues, and loved ones are in pain. If we can, for example, work together to find er ergonomically healthier ways to practice medicine, to prevent developing pain or support each other when our colleagues are in pain, I think we can create a safer environment for physicians to practice medicine in the long term. I think my mom's experience has also opened my eyes to always taking the time to check in and genuinely listen to patients because no one knows what chronic pain looks like. A lifetime of chronic pain may be hidden behind the grin they bear. How do you plan to incorporate your learning about chronic pain into your medical career moving forward? I will continue to stay engaged and interested in the research of chronic pain, looking for better understanding of the different types of pain, as well as novel modalities for treating different types of chronic pain. As someone interested in holistic medicine, I also continue to support and educate my patients in alternative modalities beyond drugs and surgery. 
and exer for instance, exercise is outside the realm of traditional healthcare approaches, yet it's probably one of the best things people with musculoskeletal pain can do for themselves. Most importantly, I will continue to um, partner with my patients to ensure that they are heard and that I will work with them to find a diversity of modalities that effectively address their pain. After hearing both of these interviews, I have a better understanding of just how complex it is to treat chronic pain. How common is chronic pain in the U.S.? Pain affects more Americans than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined, and chronic pain is the most common cause of long-term disability. Recent stats suggest that over 100 million people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain disorders. Pain can be a chronic disease, a barrier to cancer treatment, and can occur alongside other diseases and conditions such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and traumatic brain injury. Substance use disorders, including opioid overdose, are one of the most pressing health care challenges in the U.S. today. What are health care professionals recommending regarding caring for people with you know, chronic pain who are also on opioids? Well, Dr. Schumacher gave perspectives on this in my conversation with him. Let's hear from him now. So for patients that are either on high dose or they're misusing opioids, for example, what would be your treatment approach at that point? This is, in fact, one of the most pressing issues for probably all physicians and, and one of the more common reasons that our consult services is asked to see a patient, especially on the inpatient side. And uh, although each patient is unique, what I've found is that uh, many patients that are in this situation have been written off by their providers or previous hospitals that they've gone to. And just starting with the fact of, of approaching them as a human being that's having a difficult time and may have actually have a substance use disorder, an opioid use disorder, um, a real medical problem rather than a moral or a social failing, for example, just establishing that and building some trust it can be a revolution and, and a real serendipitous event for, for the patient and, and, and the team and for myself. And getting past that, we tend to then reassure the patient and, and provide them with, if they're willing, strategies that, um, especially uh, we have an increased uh, number of patients using heroin, for example. Many times those patients, of course, have turned to that because they have chronic pain or they have some other suffering, psychogenic suffering, and, and we can provide them with alternatives and we can also reassure them that we can blunt or reduce any side effects for them not using the heroin or high dose opioids um, and then give them a pathway to not only address seriously their pain problems uh, or their mood disorder or whatever and give them resources that maybe they felt they've never had before or they've never been or they've just been turned away because they have been perceived as being someone that's always angry or difficult to communicate with. So I think that um, you know the some of the the key points points here really has to do with empathy as physicians and um, setting a plan that's uh, realistic and ongoing and it's and also granted in some reality that it's not going to be solved in one day but to give someone hope back that there is a pathway that's safer for them and, and there's a way to long-term uh, address their their issues if they're willing to, to, to participate as well. While the management of chronic pain is one of the most pressing healthcare challenges in the U.S. today, I'm inspired by advances being made at UCSF to better care for people suffering from these pain disorders. Be sure to tune in to our next episode in which we explore strategies for healthy aging and discuss brain illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Music in this podcast comes from Pottington Bears Egress, licensed under CC BYNC 3.0 and available at the Internet Archive.